RSCS is a big supporter of BIM. Uh, we've been developing conferences, working collaboratively with industry on standards. Uh, we're developing training courses and we're launching a BIM manager accreditation scheme in the autumn. So when Nick Blenkarn from Seven Partnership approached us with the idea of doing a model of the Parliament Square building, we were very interested. Seeing what the RICS were doing and their research and their forward-looking uh, aspect on BIM, we thought it would be uh, a great idea for chartered surveyors to go and survey the home of chartered surveyors down at One Great George Street in London. My immediate thoughts were that if RICS was going to be a strong advocate of BIM, it should lead by example. And what better way than doing a model of its famous and historic building opposite the Houses of Parliament? We wanted to experience what many of our member firms and clients of our member firms would go through, which is how do we use BIM, what are the benefits of it, and what are the challenges of realising those benefits. We spent two weeks in total at the RICS offices. Going through, we set up a traverse, which is fixed positions in space, in plan and height, setting tripods up and taking angles and observations. Once that was done, we used that as the solid framework to build our laser scanning model around. So we scan from discrete locations, inside and out, around the RICS offices, right the way up to the roofs and down in the basements. And then we come back to the office and we glue all that data together into a registered scan cloud. One of the key things was making sure our facilities team were fully engaged and involved at the start, uh, not only as the recipients of the model, but also when the team from Seven Partnership came down with all the equipment to do the scanning, they had to make sure that staff could get access to their computers, offices and go about their normal day-to-day -day work. One of the fantastic byproducts of this project was as the Seven Partnership team were down in the RSS building, many staff and members who are visiting the building became very curious as to what's going on. They managed to see laser scanning at first hand, realise the equipment and what it did, um, see the speed and accuracy of the data and hopefully with the information the RICS put up online they'll be able to get their level of knowledge as to what is laser scanning, what is scan to BIM. Uh, up to a very high level. We've now received the model from Seven Partnership and we're now working out what to do with it. Uh, one of our first uh, challenges was making sure we have the right hardware and software to be able to run the model and understand it. Um, we've started that process. We want to share our journey, our experiences and how you get benefits so that our member firms and our clients and member firms can really understand how they can get some real benefit out of BIM. This will all be updated on our website, uh, so keep in touch with how it goes. Right, brilliant quote in there. Now we've got it, what are we going to do with it? Um, more technology works. Uh, a little bit closer to home, perhaps if you've ever been to our office in Auckland, there's some scans that we did of the, the Pitt, Street, uh, Pitt Street office. I think they sort of set up in about three, three or four locations on the outside of the building, and eight locations on the roof, and in the space of just a little over, I think they made a day doing that, found the entire building scanned. So pretty powerful sort of stuff. Um, not just buildings, that's a um, substation in South Auckland being scanned to sufficient detail to check the size of the bolts which is a downside safer and easier than climbing up there with a metal tape measure to, to measure them. Um, not just buildings, roads, and again, I'm a building services engineer, I'm not going to talk about surveying, but apparently, so I'm told, what, what you would take human captures in, in three or four weeks, you can do in a day with a vehicle, the right kind of vehicle, driving down the roads. Anyway, um, that's just one part of the whole BIM process, I'll sort of get a bit more into what BIM actually is, but Laser scanning and turning scans into models, I think is probably the fastest changing bit of BIM at the moment. And I think the reasoning behind that is um, the cost of equipment's come down, and a lot more people are doing it, and the ability to process and store huge amounts of data has changed as well. Because these these big laser clouds are just a whole bunch of dots, but there's lots of them. If you want to start processing those, it's um, pretty hard. Um, What's all the fuss about? Um, that's a guy from the UK government, and they made this statement about four years ago. And they put a real focus on it, and they're mandating them. 
So from the uh, middle of next year, every government project will have, have, have in some way be BIM enabled. I'll sort of talk a bit about what that means soon. Um, the important part of that is sort of the, the, sort of the second and third lines. It sits will change the dynamics and behaviours of the entire construction supply chain. This isn't just about engineers, this isn't just about architects, it's about everybody. Whether it's the people supplying kit, whether it's the people supplying um, building materials, whether it's the people surveying the ground before you start doing anything, the entire building supply chain that this is going to impact. Um, the pot of gold at the end of the BIM rainbow is supposedly a 20% improvement in productivity. So through the construction sector. So if you look at New Zealand by 2016, they reckon we're going to have about a $30 billion construction industry. So if you can save, even if it's not 20%, 10%, that's a pretty big number. So that's why governments in UK, Australia, Singapore, and more, more lately, New Zealand, are really trying to push this. So they see the opportunities for huge savings. Um, the 20% number is a bit of a, a hard number to prove because it's sort of counterfactual. Because when you've done something, you don't know what it would have cost you if you didn't do it. But that's based on some sort of research. Um, that's sort of what I want to cover today. Um, there's a load of information out there. Uh, I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. But there's a lot of hype. BIM is in the um, media a lot. Um, any conferences you go to, whether it's a hotel operators conference, a facility managers conference, an architects conference, you can guarantee you know, a good proportion of the um, presentations will be around this whole BIM thing. Um, there's a legal conference that recently at Northern, and they had a session on BIM and the law. Um, I don't want to spend a lot of time showing fancy models and all that kind of stuff. Um, if you go online, go onto YouTube, type BIM, you'll get a zillion hits and there's a whole bunch of very fancy presentations. And if you're interested in it, it's worth doing. What I more to focus on is what the challenges this is going to bring to the industry. That's the industry as a whole. That's for designers, for clients, for contractors, um, for operators and suppliers in the whole supply chain. Um, it's going to change how projects get briefed by clients. So when a client wants a project, what does he say to somebody? We're getting requests for proposals from um, clients, government clients, who say, oh, we want them. So you sort of say, look, what do you mean? Oh, can you draw it in Revit? Which you know, it's just, again, it illustrates how little people know about this topic. So that's what I'll, I'll try and get across today a bit about what it is, what it means, and um, what we can benefit out of it. Um, there's that great quote in that Rick's video, you know, we've got the model now, what are we going to do with it? Um, and that's fairly classic across some wide bits of the industry. Now, there's been a whole lot of talk about the, um, the what and the how of them, but nowhere near enough about the why. And the big message I want to get across, is anybody, anybody starting to think about these sort of things, don't look at what you can do look at why you're doing it. There's got to be a reason for doing it. There's got to be a gain. If you start thinking about what's the gain, then you can start balancing it against the investment. Um, you, you can go out and have a bit of a play. I mean, Rick's had a bit of a play and scan their building. Uh, we didn't need to scan our building in Auckland. We literally were just having a bit of a play with the kids to see what they do. And no, you need to do that to get some experience. But before you start rolling out these new sort of technologies on, on jobs, people need to understand you know, why you're doing it. So, what is BIM? That's a, a definition from a crowd called Building Smart. Um, they used to be called the International Alliance for Interoperability. So, they, I don't know what that, what that stands for, but they are in the US, and they're, they're probably leading what um, the US sort of government thinks around this whole building information modeling uh, environment. Um, I don't like that definition, it's too many words, no, too, too complicated. I prefer something which is a bit simpler. Structured sharing of digital information within the built environment. And when you think about that, on a lot of projects, the information that's, and the gathering of data at the very start of it is what you guys are doing. And so thinking about the data that you're gathering when you're surveying the land, surveying the building, how that's going to be used, 
throughout the whole life of the design process and the end use of the building. That's what this BIM thing is. It's not a tool. It's not a, a bit of software. It's a, a basic philosophy. It's, it's, it's a way of looking at data. That's all the stuff is, is data. Whether it's a point cloud or a, um, whether you've measured it with a, a tape measure, it's just a bit of data. How you maximise the use of that. Now don't just think about, I've been paid to survey this building. Think about why have you been paid to survey this building? What are the people going to do with that information? How are they going to process it? Uh, that's one of the big, the big things about BIM is that it's it's moving us from a sort of a paper space into a whole um, um, data-based space. I'll sort of cover that in a second. That I've got my, that slide in there. Um, if you take the introduction to the New Zealand BIM handbook, which is coming out soon, whack it into one of these word cloud engines, it produces something like that, and the size of the word is how often it gets repeated in there. So the important things are, it's obviously there's lots of about buildings and information, but the main sort of focus as I take out, it's a lot about management, coordination and process. And as soon as you get into any sort of data, if the people are in there, you guys manage a lot of data, as soon as you're into a data management process, you've got to be coordinated in what you're doing. If you've got you know, one, one crowd processing things in one way, another crowd processing things another way, it gets very, very wasted. You can't translate these things. Whilst it's pretty been driven out of what looks like um, pictures, models, it's the data behind these models that's very important. And that's sort of the mind change that people need to start thinking about. Stop thinking about what you're producing as just a, an output. Think about the data behind it. Because the beauty of data is it can get used in all sorts of different ways. Um, you can compare one set of data to another set of data. So you can um, um, model a building and compare it against another building and see what the differences are. So you can say, is, is the area bigger? Are the height to boundary ratios different? You can then start building rules based uh, equations into the database. So in theory, you can actually do online consent checking. So if you've got a certain building, which has to be so far back from the boundary, it's just so much GFA and all those kind of things, you can start doing that all automatically. Um, the Singapore government is starting to move in that space, and the New Zealand government is thinking about it. Uh, they, we're a, the first thing we'll get is a, a national online consenting system probably in the next two or three years. But they're definitely setting that up with a view to how can we automatically process consents. That's not going to be reading drawings and plans, it's going to be reading the data that comes off those plans. That, um, that drawing there, that's probably what most people see when they, you know, if you search for the BIM on, on the internet. It's this sort of the, the magic wheel of life put out by um, Autodesk, who uh, spent, I'd say, millions, three billions of dollars promoting this. And it sort of shows this, the, the, the flow of information around a whole life cycle of an asset, from its design through its construction, its fabrication. Uh, operation and maintenance, you knock the thing down, we renovate it. Um, that's a very theoretical kind of process. Um, it's very, very hard to make that happen at the moment. Um, contractually, the way projects are set up, that doesn't work. Um, you know, a designer is contracted to produce a certain amount of information, he is responsible for that, the contractor is responsible for building it. Um, contractor will only rely so much on what the designer does. He won't go and set out the building exactly from the designer's drawings. He'll go and check it himself. So that's where we should be aiming. Um, the tools we have at the moment don't make that possible. You know, the sales pitch from you know, whether it's Autodesk or Bentley or whoever says our tool, our software does everything. They don't. Um, the analysis software within all these modeling tools aren't what we call best of breed. So people are doing a model over here, they're analyzing it over there. So we're a ways away from getting, getting that sort of perfect sort of wheel of life kind of thing. But it, it's something we do need to be aiming for. Um, and it's like any of these sort of journeys, unless you know where you're heading, um, you're not going to sort of make good, good steps along the way. Um, how projects get procured makes a big difference to how successful 
that kind of integrated approach will be. Um, I think without question, if projects are procured on more of a design and build basis, where the contractor and the designers are working alongside each other, you've got far more chance of getting an integration of this whole design and construction and fabrication process. New Zealand, to date, in my view, has got a pretty bad reputation for design and build. Design and build was sort of the other word for cheap. You know, I can't afford to pay the consultants properly, so we're just going to go D and D. Uh, that's not so much the case in the UK and Australia where the majority of the major contracts there are produced through a, a design and build kind of scenario. New Zealand is sort of going down that track, but had a meeting with um, the government procurement office probably about a month ago, and they were asking us um, how can they maximise their benefit from them. I said, well, you, know, you need to start looking at how you're procuring things. You need to look at procuring people who... Um, understand what this process is, understand what value it can give you, and select them on that basis. Unfortunately, they're saying our rules are we've got to take the lowest price performing bid, which is just, you know, as soon as you've got a, a race to the bottom like that, you know, you're never going to maximise the benefits from these kinds of things. Um, there's a lot of case studies out there which talk about this thing called IPD, or Integrated Project Delivery. Um, that's sort of a building's version of an alliance. I'm not sure what is happening in, in sort of the Wellington space, but up in Auckland, the Waterview Tunnel, Vic Park Tunnel, those were all alliance projects where people, work, where the designers and the contractors were working alongside each other. They are sort of an environment where this kind of thing can work. We can have a designer sitting next to a fabricator, sitting next to a supplier, and only doing thing, doing a doing thing once. A lot of what I'm sort of talking about is from a, sort of a building perspective. Um, it can apply to a road, it can apply to an uh, industrial facility, it can apply to anything, any, anything that you construct. And as I said earlier on, every part of the supply chain that fits into it, whether it's at the start, in the middle when um, equipment's being procured, or at the end when it's being operated, has a place to play. Um, one of the big gains out of the whole uh, asset management thing is getting buildings to operate more, more efficiently and effectively. And for that to happen, the people who operate them need to be involved in the design. You know, they need to be involved in the decisions that people make. Um, we've been involved in lots of projects where the project team will say, okay, yep, you go over there and talk to the facilities managers and find out what they want. We'll come back with a shopping list, oh, you know, we'd like to have more energy efficient that, we'd like longer life this. If it doesn't fit the project budget, it's canned. That sort of attitude has got to change. And that's what I'm sort of saying. It's the whole supply chain of the industry that's got to start looking at changing. If you just start playing around the edges, you won't get the gains that it's been looked at. Um, that's more my picture of what I think BIM is. Not that sort of single wheel. I think there's three big worlds of BIM. Design BIM, build BIM, and operate BIM. And you can get significant gains in any of those spaces. You don't have to be playing in all of them. That's something else that's been sort of scaring clients that, oh, I don't know what I'm going to use this for in the end, so um, I won't do anything. Um, as designers, just architects, engineers, quantity surveyors, there are benefits we can get from aligning our processes, aligning the way we treat data. You know, if, if we do uh, a drawing, make a model in a way that a quantity surveyor can take a schedule straight out of it, that's a gain. If we can produce coordinated information that allows a contractor to install it quicker, faster, with less changes, that's a gain. If a contractor, they build their own model just so that they can program the whole facility better, Again, that's, that's, that's a gain for them. Whole, you, you don't have to do the whole magic circle of life to start getting benefits. In some ways, you're better off focusing on the little bits, getting those sorted, and then try and maximise the whole. Um, from uh, your perspective as to where you fit into that, there might be a, you know, there might be a, um, a survey world out there, or are you just part of each of those other ones? I, I don't know. And that's the other thing that the only people who can drive where they fit into the industry is themselves. You know, you can, it's, it's stupid a building services engineer telling you 
where you should fit into this industry. I can tell you what the industry is doing, I can tell you how clients and the whole process are sort of moving together, but how you fit into it, that's something that you guys need to drive. I'm more than happy to help, but again, I'm not qualified to um, comment on things like that. Um, very briefly, this is just um, terminology. If if you look through um, documentation on this, what the UK government is driving for is to achieve what they're calling level two, level two BIM by the middle of next year. What that really is is people all collaborating, doing work in their own space, bringing things together to collaborate. Uh, level 3 BIM, which is where every works in this magical single model, it's just not practically realisable yet. Yeah, the computing power isn't there. Um, if anybody starts playing in these big databases or these big model spaces, it can sort of work around a single office. You start trying to work across multiple offices in a single city, it starts getting a bit challenged just purely from the logistics of moving data around. I'm trying to do it around the world. Now, from what, in a global operation, it just doesn't work at the moment. So again, the move to cloud computing, when everything's happening up in the, the ether up there, that, that will start allowing the next level to happen. But at the moment, level two is literally just getting people playing nicely in the same sample together. Guidelines, as I said, the New Zealand Firm Handbook, that's what it's going to look like in all its appendices. Um, that gets released next Friday or Friday week. Went to the pub, well, got signed off, went to the publishers on um, last Friday. Uh, and that's been about a year in the making. Um, started off with around a workshop of up north with 50 people from various parts of the industry. Um, we commissioned, uh, I'm involved in what's called the BIM Acceleration Committee, which is an MB um, sort of committee that um, they set up through the productivity partnership. We paid. Um, a guy from Australia who wrote their guide to come over and run this workshop and draft all this thing up. And then a year later we've sort of torn it to pieces, rewritten it, put it back together again, and we've come up with what we think is probably one of the simplest guides in the that I've seen around the world. And I've looked at lots of these things. Um, and it's a very good place to build from. And what we want is and it's been deliberately very focused on buildings and deliberately very focused on the design and construction phase of them. We haven't really put a lot of effort into you know, the gathering of data, the, the, the information that provides the land that you, you build on. We haven't done a lot in the geotechnical space. We haven't done a lot, lot, lot in the operational space. What we've done is created what we think is a, a pretty good core for people to build off. If people look, look at it and say, oh, that's pretty interesting. Where does my bit fit into that? And we reckon we'll probably have another reprint of this in probably about 12 to 18 months' time. So over that next 12 to 18 months, we're hoping that like the Facility Managers Association in New Zealand will say, hey, we want a part of this. Does the handbook get bigger? Is there another appendices? I, I don't know. Um, New Zealand Institute of Surveyors, you know, they should have a part of it. Is it a, another section in front? I, again, have a read of it when it comes out next week. Have a look at it. See how it will fit into your industry and see what needs to go into it to make your industry uh, work better. That's, that's what all this is about, is trying to avoid confusion, trying to avoid people talking about um, stuff that is counterproductive. So you don't get clients asking you, um, please give me some BIM, at least they understand the rules. The main common thing in all these um, BIM guides is the focus on the, the why of BIM, or BIM uses. What are you going to get out of it? Uh, the New Zealand Guide lists 21 different uses from you know, design authoring, um, coordination, um, disaster management, asset management. There's 21 of these things. Now, for each one of those, there's a different skill set required, a different um, investment required. So what we want clients to do is look at these things and say, oh, yes, I can get some benefit out of that. I want to do that use. Uh, how much is it going to cost me? Um, there's been a bit of a sort of a push around the industry over the last oh, probably two years that all these new modeling tools are so good that you can design things cheaper and easier and we get it for free. Um, 
hopefully we've dispelled that message and clients now see that if they want to get benefits at the end, they need to invest up front. Um, where is New Zealand at? Um, I think the architects, that'll change, it does change, that's good. The architects, engineers, and people in the design space are as good as anyone in the world. I think our basic designers are, are, are pretty good in, in producing sort of pretty crash off pictures and models. Um, the project managers in New Zealand are starting to become aware of them and what it means. And that's actually scary because they're the people who should be driving this. Um, contractors, um, Fletchers are very interested in it now. Uh, they sent a couple of people um, to the UK and the US about a month ago to find out about this. So they're in, in this sort of space on their um, on their building side. Uh, they've been doing it in their road building side for years. And Mackay's to Pekapek had a talk from this head of the survey guy from Fletchers on Mackay's to Pekapek. All their um, all their diggers being sort of GPS enabled, basically digging stuff out based on the model. That's been it's been happening for years. Should go back on that. Uh, one of the main things about it, 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 it's a communication tool, and if you can get people to understand stuff, um, it's easier to com communicate um, ideas. This is something which. I think it took less than an afternoon to put together. Basically just pulling stuff down off the internet, making it into 3D, um, trying a bit of a road design that someone was going to do, pulling all the, all the services. It's all, literally, I think, less than an afternoon to pull all this together. There's a new, new road design by, by Eden Park. And going to stakeholders and exchange, this is what we're looking at doing. Now this is what, it, this is what we're looking to do in your sort of environment. These are the changes that are going to happen. It's far easier to convince people with this kind of stuff than it is with um, drawings and all that kind of stuff. And it's very, very easy and very, very quick to do. And if you are not doing it, or if we're not doing it, you can guarantee that your competition are, and um, they will win the job. Um, we know that we have lost work over Australia in the roading area because we were competing against somebody who included 14 different options with fly-throughs as part of their bid. We, we, we included some pretty words of pictures. I'd like to think we came second, but I don't think we even came second. Um, it, it isn't radically changing the process. Um, you know, the whole thing of getting a brief from a client, doing some analysis, Doing some documentation is exactly the same and constructing it. All it's doing is smoothing the way this information moves between all of these things. Um, you still need a clear brief. Without a clear brief, you don't know what you're doing. Um, this is a drawing which gets banded around the construction sector quite a lot. It's, it's sort of basically showing that you know, the, the blue line, the very you can have far more impact on a design at the start of it. And as the time goes on, the cost of your changes become even more and more. What this is sort of showing in terms of curves three and four is for, for a, a BIM kind of project, the effort is coming more and more up front. You need to invest more at the front of the project to gain, gain at the end. And again, clients need to understand that, which means they need to make, client, they need to make decisions earlier on. Um, sort of finishing off, I stole this from a, a lawyer over in Australia. That those were his ten BIM commandments. I won't go through them all. The, the ones that um, I sort of tend to focus on: number three, four, and six, which is best for project. You need to make sure everyone is on the same page. You need to make sure who is making the investment and who is getting the benefits and how those get balanced up. Uh, number four, um, really sort of what's the best for asset? Start with the end in mind. Uh, what's the best long-term use of this asset? So what's the best gain we can get out of this asset for um, going through this process? And finally, beware the buzzwords, number six. BIM is not magic. It will not fix a bad brief. It will not fix incompetent designers. It will not fix 
that people go and think wrong. It is just a way of making stuff hopefully move at speed up. The future, um, they're already 3D printing buildings. So you get a model, you push the print button and you end up with a building. Um, cloud computing will start um, changing the way we do stuff and will enable a whole lot more to happen. Um, prefabrication, again, by doing a lot more digital design, you can do a lot more prefabrication, which should make buildings cheaper, faster, and one of the good side things is it makes them safer to build. The more you prefabricate, the safer things are. But the bottom line is, uh, business is a little choice. You either ignore it, or you lead it. And the industry is changing. If you don't, you end up like that fella. Thanks. All right, good morning, everybody. Um, it's good to stand in front of you with a slightly different hat on to the one I've worn for the last nine or ten years. So um, I'm a surveyor. I, I know a lot of the faces of a lot of you here. So uh, I'm a surveyor myself, um, and my role for the last, starting from a few months ago, is with Becker in Christchurch. It's a business development role, particularly focusing on the survey side of our business, um, essentially making sure that we've got a good solid pipeline of work coming in to, uh, to feed the, the very uh, expanded group of surveyors that, that we have down there. So we've taken on quite a few more people in the last few years and we want to make sure that it carries on that way. So um, what we're going to talk about is, is particularly where the surveyor can plug into this BIM cycle. So um, especially where the surveyor plugs in, how you go about making the most of BIM. So where BIM is this large process, this, uh, this idea of a perhaps an integrated workflow around the entire cycle of a, of a building or an infrastructure. Um, where are the elements that a surveyor can most easily and most perhaps profitably plug into that cycle? This is a, another version of the same cycle that John put up. Like you said, you can, you can Google it and it's all, it's all over the place. Um, but what I've done there is just tried to draw out the fact that there are a number, a large number of elements that a surveyor is uniquely positioned to be able to contribute to, to this cycle. So from um, the starting point, which is kind of nominally in here somewhere, if we're thinking of starting with a new building, um, there are opportunities for uh, initial site surveys, initial condition surveys through to detailed design where it may well be that you're coming into an existing structure that's going to be modified or, or renovated. Uh, so there are opportunities for existing condition aspect surveys in there. Uh, as we go through to the fabrication stage, one of the things that we're starting to see happen is, is steel fabricators either requiring surveyors to come in and survey bolt positions before they bring the steel to site. Or in some cases, and we're seeing this particularly overseas, we go into the workshop and we make sure that the jigs that are being set up to prefabricate structural units are actually set up according to the design. So if we can take a three-dimensional design out of the 3D model from Revit, for example, and we can translate that and compare that to what's being constructed on the shop floor which could be in a completely different country or a completely different city before it arrives on site. So there's kind of two approaches to that one. Um, during construction phase, obviously set out. And, and what we're starting to see from some of the main contractors is a requirement that all of the set out or new construction is done in three dimensions by a survey. And that's a real uh, obvious, really, sort of logical step. On the operation and maintenance side of things, whoops, Let's go back. That was the wrong button. On the operation and maintenance side of things, where that's not something that the surveyor is actually really involved with on a day-to-day -day basis, the three D data that has been acquired through the construction phase feeds in to the operation and maintenance side of the building, and then uh, for renovations again for as-built work there. So 
there are a lot of areas that we can plug into just by understanding what the contractors or the clients require from the BIM cycle, we can identify where we can sort of best take advantage of that and serve that. And so this this whole idea of, of BIM is a it's kind of a big monster that, that you know you kind of there's a bit of reluctance almost to take that first step to to try to start to understand it. And it was it was very much the same when when our industry started to adopt GPS equipment, you know, 20, 25 years ago, um, robotic total stations, uh, perhaps more recently, RTK networks. And if you think about those sorts of technologies, a lot of businesses are actually built on them now. You know, they're essential. Who would have thought even three years ago how critical RTK networks would be to our everyday work? that we do on a day-to-day -day basis, but they're there now. But at the time, technologies like GNSS and, uh, and GIS in particular were, were a big hurdle to overcome. We had to get to grips with it and really understand it and understand how to make the most of it for our businesses. Now we're at a stage where capabilities such as 3D machine control and laser scanning are also relatively recent. 3D machine control actually is when you look at it, it goes back 20 years. Laser scanning maybe 10 years. But they are really quite well understood <coughs> now. And where we are where we are utilizing that capability, then we're actually taking big strides forward with with, um, with adopting the technology and, and making the most of the technology. And so the real opportunity now, and, and laser scanning of course points into that as in some of these other positioning technologies. The real opportunity is is BIM. This is the big the big new thing that we can get to grips with. Now BIM is a little bit different, you know, it's not a GPS receiver. We can't we can't just pick it up and say this is this is it. I can I can play with it, I can understand it. It's not really a survey technology, it, it's a concept. You know, it's a concept and it's a method by which all elements of the built environment can be can be tied together in, in theoretically one uh, continual cycle, but perhaps more practically, as John said, you know, discrete segments. So it's it's not like a GPS receiver, but um, it, it's not a single tool, but it is an enabler that helps us to. Uh, that identify where we can we can get involved with the construction cycle. And I think it might be painful, but it's perhaps helpful to just think about when GIS was first starting to be introduced, because there's a lot of actual sort of common themes between GIS as a as a, an industry and, and BIM. And um, I think a lot of us might look back 25 years ago when GIS really started to become more common and think, would we have would we have operated differently? Would we have got involved with this with this capability a little bit differently if we knew then what we knew now? There were certainly some real opportunities for survey to get involved and to guide the development of GIS systems, which were possibly, I would suggest, missed at the time and, and um, could have really benefited. We lost a lot of business there, I think, too to others who stepped in and plugged the gap and started to do GIS data collection and made mistakes that could have been prevented if the survey was involved early on. A lot of similarities there with 3D machine control as well, perhaps, where what we've seen is the major contractors going and employing their own surveyors who sit outside of the institute often uh, to, to, to do the work and to manage the three-dimensional data that's required to get from the design of a road through to construction of a, of a highway. And some of us are, some of us are involved in, in that, but again, there's, there certainly was a chance to get more involved and, and get a little bit more benefit from 3D machine control. And I would suggest that, that this idea of BIM is, we want to avoid what we lost with the GIS and machine automation. And that's what these seminars are about. So.
it's a three-dimensional world, and BIM is a three-dimensional sort of concept. The whole, every stage of the construction cycle, the BIM cycle, is tied together through three-dimensional data. Whether it's a 3D structural design or a 3D architectural um, massing model, or whether it's a three-dimensional design of MEP services within a building or under a street, uh, 3D is the aspect of BIM that, as surveyors, I think we inherently we inherently understand, and it lets us take advantage of the opportunities. And um, John mentioned that. BIM is often thought of as, as being a, a, a building's sort of uh, application, but really it doesn't matter whether it's a, a large vessel or whether it's a, a piece of uh, roading infrastructure, you can apply BIM principles to, to that capability. And that, there's a really good example of, that's quite easy to grasp that comes out of Christchurch, and that is the redesign of the water and wastewater services throughout Christchurch. And that's one of the, a great project where, under the sort of umbrella of, of SCIRT, a large number of different survey organisations were brought together to capture data in a completely consistent way, deliver it in three-dimensional digital standard format as a 12DA in this particular case. The design and the hydrological modelling was all done in 12D, all in the standard format. And the deliverable was a three-dimensional data set to go and set that, set that new stormwater system out on the ground. And then as it's being set out, the contractors are building it, and they're capturing GIS-style attribute information along with three-dimensional as-built data that is going to go directly into feeding the repair and maintenance of that wastewater system. So it's a, got a complete parallel with these cycles that we're talking about here, and it's possibly on a much more manageable scale than a major building, but there's a lot of relevance to that, and it sort of demonstrates the, the capability of tying everything together with 3D data, which is what we do. So 3D is where it needs to be, and um, you know, in many cases now we're we're going out and doing a three-dimensional topographical survey. I don't really think there's any other way you can do a topographical survey. But it's a 3D survey, but how often is it presented as a 2D plan and maybe an elevation model for the, for the um, soft detail, surface detail? Um, how many times have you been out on a construction site to set out a road alignment? And you have to kind of reconstruct that alignment from 3D data that's been done in in a design package, and then the curves at the intersections have been made to look pretty because they're 2D, 2D CAD like. But you've got to reconstruct the data. If it's, it's all in three dimensions, then the whole process is out. It's going to be very smooth. So, 3D presents the opportunities for surveyors, and if we look in a bit more detail at each of these areas, the design stage, so before any work is done, there's clearly a uh, capability to go, and, to go and, and pick up the existing features in an area that we're going to be working. So in this case, it's, it's a laser scan, and you can sort of see that that would feed into the architectural process as well, because we might be interested in the, um, in the Becker building just here, but from an architectural point of view, they're probably very interested in the impact that it's going to have on all the surrounding areas here, and they commonly would re uh, rely on, on something out of Google Earth, you know, 3D buildings out of Google Earth to try to build a picture of that, but the sort of scan data gives it to them almost free in this case. It's a byproduct of scanning the existing structures. Of course, I'm not suggesting that laser scanning is the only technology that feeds into these. This is just one, one aspect. It could very well be conventional robotic GPS technology. Um, if we're designing to add some additional plant to an existing structure, or we've got examples where a building is being extended and it's, it's essentially a building that's filled, filled with uh, pipe work and, and vessels and that sort of stuff, um, then there may be opportunities to go in and, and scan or survey the existing plant infrastructure, which 
may be the end of the line. That's all that's required. It's just a point count, but obviously um, there's certainly opportunities for, for modeling that infrastructure as well and reducing the model and then feeds into the design process in, in Revit or wherever. This is another example of um, some silos uh, up on, a, on an existing platform and the idea is they want to put a third silo up here and so um, what's the existing condition like? So we can go in and we can scan the existing condition and then model the, the steel elements and then do some stress analysis on those modeled elements. And uh, that's certainly a good, uh, good application for scanning and perhaps one of the more um, well understood applications. Opportunities at the construction stage. There are a number of, of tools and packages that will do this, but in this particular case we've got point tools from AutoCAD taking data directly out of the, the, the 3D design in Revit, for example, and extracting that data as 3D set out data to go into a piece of survey equipment. So um, very much uh, as we would take data out of um, 12D or Civil 3D or Civil CAD or wherever we're operating now, um, there are plenty of software packages out there that will extract data from 3D models in a, in a sort of Revit type environment. Steel fabrication we talked a little bit about. Um, it's a case of understanding what the what, what's required from from the survey and the steel fabrication area. Whether it's um, you know where you've got existing in a, in a case like this where the steel is not particularly complex, then quite possibly what's going to happen is go go to the site once the slab has been poured and the bolts are in place and go and survey the bolt bolt head positions so that the fabricator can make sure that what's been built by the previous contractor. He's going to be able to come in, bring the steel, and drop it onto those bolt positions. And I'm sure there's a few of them doing that sort of thing now. Um, so that's one approach, and, and the other approach is to um, is to, to check the steel um, before it leaves the shop. <laughs> MEP services, any services actually within a building. Um, there is the start of a drive towards have these service, having these services set out by a surveyor in three dimensions. And, you know, on the one hand, that might seem quite a daunting prospect. Um, the reason I chose this slide is because actually, you know, there are a series of alignments. It's like a road, really. It could be a road junction with, with various alignments in there. Um, so if we, if we can have a design in Revit, for example, that is, uh, which is built with the knowledge that the data is going to be exported and used by a surveyor for 3D set out, then it becomes relatively straightforward to get the 3D design data out onto an instrument through you know, any of the main manufacturer's instrumentation and, um, and set that data out in three dimensions. Uh, but there is a, there's a couple of things there. One is that the, the elements in the model need to be set out with an understanding of how they, sorry, need to be designed with an understanding of how they're going to be set out in the field. So what does the surveyor need uh, in order to be able to set those things out? Is it the centre line of the pipe? Is it the lowest point on the centre line of a, of a tray? Or if we look at this ducting in here, you know, what are the points that are important to be able to set this out? Is it every single hanger? Um, are we going to set the hangers out from underneath, or are we going to set it out from on top and drill through the concrete? So there, there's a lot to understand about the design and construction process, and I think one of the key things is going to be bringing the subtrades along for the ride, really early involvement with the subtrades, to make sure that we as surveyors know what they actually need to be able to build the services in, in the single space. So that's it process that we've gone through with roading and we've all did at university but we haven't got any uh, sort of education on uh, how to go about setting out MEP services. 
this, I guess, is another um, kind of classic application of laser scanning in building construction, particularly. <laughs> um, the red <laughs> speculum is the point cloud, and the solid colors are the design elements in a product like Revit. Uh, Revit. And what we can see here is that we've got a design uh, ducting, looks like a ventilation duct, which is the solid green duct here, which has been designed to be in a particular three-dimensional position so it doesn't clash with these lighting elements. But it's been built much lower than it was designed. So now we've got a clash between this element here and this light here. And being able to scan during the building process, not just as built at the end, but during the process, as soon as that, that duct has been installed and perhaps uh, the rest of this uh, sort of area of the job has been completed, we come in, we complete the scan, and we compare, we compare that as built stage to the model. And pretty quickly in products like Navisworks, it will highlight all the clashes that exist in that model. We can then start to design around what's being constructed, saving a hell of a lot of money by reducing rework once the kit has been brought to site and trying to make it fit. Once it's been built, there's a lot of opportunities for monitoring, maybe monitoring uh, around uh, existing structures of, uh, over and above and around a tunneling job that's taken place or an open cut. Um, it may be verifying that uh, a floor has been constructed to the appropriate degree of flatness. We're getting quite good at these in Christchurch at the moment. Uh, it could be as built verification, so we might be using a point cloud as an independent verification of our as built survey. We might have done some conventional string line type stuff, and then we are overlaid that on the point cloud to give us a, an independent and very quick check. Uh, in this particular example, there were a couple of things that we missed. From the, um, from the survey of the hard features that we were able to go back to the point cloud and extract them from the point cloud and uh, reduce the uh, need to revisit the site. And obviously, uh, as built, once you get to the final built structure, whether it's this, oops, button's wrong again, whether it's a steel structure or whether it's existing services, then we can go in and we can scan that, and that forms the basis for this whole area of facilities management and repairs and maintenance. So knowing exactly where your infrastructure is within a building um, lets you far more economically manage and maintain it. And for refurbishment renovation, you might have an existing steel uh, roofing structure which you can go and scan and then design some new glass facade or some new roofing elements on top of that. So I guess the challenges for us are to, and you're, you're accepting this challenge already because you're here today and you're learning about it and this is not going to be the end of your learning, this is really just a starting point or another step along the way. But it's about learning about the BIM process really understanding where the surveyor can plug into that process, identifying the opportunities and make the most of the, of the opportunities that it presents. We're not really doing anything new, we're using some new tools, some new techniques, we're understanding where our unique skills are and where they're best utilised within this whole